Denise here. Um, I'm going to be leading you through the read aloud um, for A Trail of Tears, a native of Maine. Um, I'm really excited to share this with you, and um, I think this subject is really interesting, um, talking about Native American history and this moment um, of the Trail of Tears and the Indian Removal Act. Um, it has really profound impacts on American history and will even connect to events that are happening today that we're all aware of, which we'll talk about later. Um, today we're going to be reading a primary source, um, which means it's told from someone who witnessed the event, was there at the time, um, and it's from their perspective or point of view. Um, when I was searching for a primary source for the Trail of Tears, I really did want to find um, a primary source from someone who was Native American, um, who was experiencing this trail. Um, it was very difficult to find one from the point of view of someone who is Native American, um, probably because they um, didn't know how to write. Um, they weren't educated in, in school. Um, they were still very intelligent, but might not have had systems of reading and writing and weren't writing down and documenting what was happening, probably especially when they were in such an intense event. Um, so this is a primary source from um, a white man who is experiencing this, and you'll learn more about this going forward. Okay, so our teaching point for the day is that readers of historical texts, primary sources, think about the author's points, point of view of events in history. They stop to think about the main ideas of the text and what the author is trying to convey, which means teach, about that moment in history. And I put some vocabulary that is gonna be useful to us as we read through this text. Um, so a detachment, one meaning of that means like a group. Um, fatigue means extremely tired, almost sick. Unwilling means not wanting or refusing to do something. Accosted means approached aggressively, like someone comes up suddenly, maybe asks you questions. And a primary source is a historic text told at or close to the time of the event by a person who experienced the event firsthand. Um, so keep those words in mind. You'll be seeing them as we go through the text. Um, and they're also good words to know and use in your speaking and writing. All right. The Trail of Tears, a native of Maine. Um, I'm noticing already that this part is in italics um, and it's at the beginning. And usually when I see italics before a text, it usually means that that's the introduction to the text. Um, so I think this is introducing the primary source. At the beginning of the 1830s, nearly 125,000 Native Americans lived on millions of acres of land in Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, North Carolina, and Florida, the land their ancestors had lived on for generations. Sadly, as part of Andrew Jackson's Indian removal policy, the federal government forced them to leave their homelands and walk thousands of miles to a specially designated Indian territory across the Mississippi River. The Cherokee people faced hunger and disease on this difficult journey known as the Trail of Tears. About 4,000 of the 16,000 Cher Cherokee people died on this forced march. So you can probably figure out that that's one fourth of the total amount of people who died. A Maine newspaper correspondent wrote the following account after watching Cherokee people pass through Kentucky in 1838. So I'm learning that the point of view that this primary source is told in is someone who is a newspaper correspondent. Um, and they were watching people pass through um, Kentucky on the Trail of Tears. Um, so to me, that shows that he kind of has a limited point of view um, because he wasn't Native American and he wasn't there for the duration of the forced removal West, but he was watching it as it went through one part of the country. Um, so that's whose point of view this text is going to be told from. It's always important to keep the author's perspective and who they are in mind. All right, let's get started. On Tuesday evening, we fell in with a detachment of the poor Cherokee Indians. That poor despised people are now on their long and tedious march to their place of destination beyond the Mississippi River. In the first detachment which we met were about 1,100 Indians, 
60 wagons, 600 horses, and perhaps 40 pairs of oxen. We found them in the forest camped for the night by the roadside, comfortable. If comfortable, they might be in a December night and under a severe fall of rain accompanied with heavy wind. With their canvas for a shield from the inclemency of the weather and the cold, wet ground for a resting place after the fatigue of the day, they spent the night with probably as little of the reality as the appearance of comfort. We learned from the officers and overseers of the detachment in the morning that many of the aged Indians were suffering extremely from the fatigue of the journey and the ill health consequent upon it. Several were then quite ill and one aged man, we were informed, was then in the last struggles of death. There were about 10 officers and overseers in each detachment whose business it was to provide supplies for the journey and attend to the general wants of the company. The cost of the journey is paid by the American government as one of the conditions of the pretended treaty, which many of the Indians still called fraudulent. Hmm, I thought that was really interesting at the end that the author called it a pretended treaty. So I think this shows his point of view that he doesn't believe the Indian Removal Act was a true treaty. Um, and this was because Native Americans were forced into signing it. They didn't really agree to it. They didn't really want to move west to new lands that wasn't their home. Um, so it's interesting how, you know, really choice words like that can reveal an author's point of view. Um, so I want to stop here to think about what was the main idea of this section. Um, and I think the main idea of this section was how the Native Americans' journey west was very tedious. They suffered through cold, wet weather, and with little protection. Some natives, especially the elderly, were becoming sick and dying. So in my own words, I kind of just summarized this part, um, and that's what I feel the main idea of this part is. That's the, the, the big idea the author is trying to convey in this section. The officers informed us. Um, so I also think it's interesting, like he keeps talking about how he's getting information from the officers. So that's telling me that this newspaper correspondent is like maybe asking questions or kind of interviewing some of the officers who, you know, who were white, like the white members of the government who were appointed to um, supervise the Native Americans traveling west. The officers informed us that the Indians were very unwilling to go, so much so that 200 had escaped in collecting them together and secreted themselves in the mountains in Georgia in the eastern part of Tennessee. And those who were on the way were so unwilling to pursue their journey that it was some days quite late in the evening before they could get them underway. And even then they went reluctantly. I know it is said that only a few were unwilling to go. The most go willingly and think the remove on the whole and advantage the nation. The testimony of the officers and observation have both tended to confirm the belief. However, in my mind, that the great majority of the nation feel that they are wronged, grievously wronged, and nothing but arbitrary power compels them to remove. So I'm going to stop and think about the main idea of this section. And I think what the author is trying to convey in this section is that the Native Americans felt that the forced removal was unfair and they did not want to have to move west. They were unwilling to move west. The last detachment, which we passed on the 7th, embraced rising 2,000 Indians with horses and mules in proportion. The forward part of the train we found just pitching their tents for the night and notwithstanding some 30 or 40 wagons were already stationed. We found the road literally filled with the procession for about three miles in length. So this is really creating like a vivid movie in my mind. I'm seeing like just many people and animals filling the road for miles. Like it's packed. The sick and feeble were carried in wagons, about as comfortable for traveling as a New England ox cart with a covering for it. A great many ride on horseback and multitudes go on foot. Even aged females, apparently, nearly ready to drop into the grave, were traveling with heavy burdens attached to the back, on the sometimes frozen ground and sometimes muddy streets, with no covering for the feet, except what nature had given them. I thought that phrase, ready to drop into the grave, was really interesting. Um, it actually sounded like some figurative language. 
Um, and I think it, it's figurative language, meaning people who were so sick that they were almost dying. Um, and I'm also creating more of a movie in my mind, a mental movie of that Native Americans just really weren't well prepared. Not that it was their fault, they just didn't have the right things that they needed for this trip. Like they barely had shoes, they barely had protection from the harsh weather um, that was contributing to their suffering. So I said Native Americans weren't well equipped for the journey west and the trip was very physically harsh. That means it was hard on their, on their bodies. We were some hours making our way through the crowd, which brought us in close contact with the wagons in the multitude, so much that we felt fortunate to find ourselves freed from the crowd without leaving any part of our carriage. We learned from the inhabitants on the road where the Indians passed that they buried 14 to 15 at every stopping place, and they made a journey of 10 miles per day only on average. Wow, so that's giving me a lot of information. Um, first of all, I think it's really interesting like how badly this newspaper correspondent wanted to leave the crowd even though he wasn't in it that long. So imagine having to be in it for hundreds and hundreds of miles. Um, and on that note about how long it's taking them, they're going 10 miles a day, which might seem long, but if they're traveling for, you know, a thousand or several hundred miles, that means it's going to take them like many, many, many days. Um, that they're in this really packed um, trip of people and animals. One aged Indian who was the commander of the Friendly Creeks in Seminoles in a very important engagement in company with General Jackson was accosted on arriving in a little village in Kentucky by an aged man residing there and who was one of Jackson's men in the engagement referred to and asked if he, the Indian, recollected him. The aged chieftain looked him in the face and recognized him, and with a downcast look and heavy sigh, referring to the engagement, he said, Ah, my life and the lives of my people were then at stake for you and your country. I then thought Jackson my best friend, but ah, Jackson serves me, no serve me right. Your country no do me justice now. So I thought this was really powerful. Um, this was like the little bit of a Native American perspective that we get, even though it is told still through this um, white newspaper correspondent. Um, but we're learning that this chief, this Native American chief, had once worked with Andrew Jackson, the president at the time of the Trail of Tears, and thought that Jackson was a friend or had the Native Americans' backs. This chief had put his and the lives of his people at risk for Andrew Jackson. But now, after the Indian Removal Act started taking place, the chief realizes that Jackson was not an ally. So your independent work today, um, you're gonna be answering the short response question, what is the author of this primary source's point of view of the Native American's forced removal west? So you can check the instructions in this read aloud assignment for where to type your response. Um, your teacher might have put a Google form or a Google doc, um, but this is the question that you're going to be thinking about and answering. What is the author of this primary source's point of view of the Native Americans forest removal west? And don't forget to include two pieces of text evidence. Um, also, there is a lot happening in our current day with coronavirus or COVID-19 and how it's impacting um, Native American communities specifically. Um, Native Americans are also still going through conflicts of land rights. Um, and I think this could be interesting for you to do some research. I might attach um, an article about this for you to explore and write a reflection of. Um, but I want you to know that this isn't just something that happened long ago and we can forget about this history of the Trail of Tears and forced Indian removal um, is impacting people and communities right now in 2020. Um, so thank you for being here and doing this read aloud with me. Have a wonderful day.